So uh, the title of my talk is, uh, let's spotlight it, Consequences of Conformality. And of course, uh, I uh, can imagine that it may not be immediately clear uh, to you uh, what all of this means, uh, in particular what conformality means, but hopefully you'll have a good idea of this at the end of my talk. So one of the purposes of my talk is to explain what the title means. So the main topic of my talk will be uh, critical behavior in various substances. And as a little invitation, as an introduction to explain what this means, let's start with something extremely simple, the liquid gas critical point. So uh, the transition that you all know, which is for example, the transition uh, uh, of boiling water where there's a gaseous phase and a liquid uh, phase. And normally you experience this in uh, Earth's gravitational field, things look a little bit different, but just to see what this means uh, in its own, without the effects of gravity, I've taken this picture, which has been taken uh, uh, aboard uh, the space shuttle, I believe, uh, so in a micro uh, gravity environment. So let's start with that transition. Uh, if physicists uh, describe the transition, they generally draw a so-called uh, phase diagram, uh, where on the vertical axis, you have the pressure, or in the horizontal axis, you have the temperature. And as we all know, at constant pressure, for example, water and many other substances start out in a solid phase. Um, if you increase the temperature at constant pressure, there's a phase transition. You will find a liquid phase afterwards. And if you increase the uh, temperature even further, you'll find a gaseous phase eventually. So what happens if you dial the pressure is that these phases persist. Um, the exact temperature at which the phase transition happens changes a little bit. So for many substances, it looks like this for the solid to liquid phase transition. And the liquid to gas phase transition uh, in many substances merges with the um, solid to liquid phase transition like this at the so-called um, triple point. And um, what is very interesting is that at some point, this liquid to gas phase transition, it ends at a, a point that is known as a critical point. And it is this particular point that uh, in the phase diagram of substances that I'd like to talk about. So notice that it's a very interesting point. You see that um, if you're beyond the critical point in this region here, there is no longer a difference between the liquid and the gaseous phase. And you can see this in experiments where this uh, clear distinction that you see in the picture on the right has disappeared, as, uh, will disappear if you um, increase the temperature or the pressure uh, too far. So there are many YouTube videos, uh, for example, on carbon dioxide uh, going critical that you can easily find, which, uh, which show this interesting phenomenon. So what I'm interested in is the behavior at the critical point. And if you would ask me to um, describe the behavior of a physical system in the vicinity of the critical point, in two words, I would say power laws, because power laws are the name of the game. Um, so as two examples, I've sketched here on the right uh, two different uh, quantities that you can measure, um, uh, both as a function of temperature. So let's uh, associate a certain DC, a critical temperature and a critical pressure to this critical point. Um, and then as a function of temperature, you can, for example, consider the specific heat of this substance in constant volume, Cv. And this is our first example of a power law you see that in this case, the specific heat diverges um, as I've sketched here in the plot. And it diverges precisely in this power law fashion with the particular power that I've denoted here as alpha, which is known as a critical exponent. Um, <clears throat> this is just one example of a critical exponent. In fact, there are many other power laws and consequently many other power critical exponents. So for example, you can take um, the difference in density between the liquid and the gaseous phase for liquid minus rho gas. And of course, it has to vanish at the critical point because beyond it, there is no distinction between these two uh, phases. And the way it vanishes is again, in terms as a function of temperature, is again in terms of uh, a power law where the power, uh, the critical exponent now is traditionally denoted as beta. So these are two examples. As I said, um, many other observables, for example, the compressibility here or the shape of the critical isoterm, uh, which is denoted by, uh, which uh, you can write like so, um, are all determined in terms of uh, power laws. And each of those 
have uh, their own critical exponents, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta associated to them. Uh, I see a question whether alpha and beta are positive. Uh, beta is positive, alpha can have an uh, uh, arbitrary sign. We'll find the system where it's negative in a second. Um, <clears throat> what is remarkable about these uh, critical exponents is if the, you measure them for very substances, which all have a critical point in their phase diagram, like carbon dioxide, neon, krypton, and so on, is that you find always the same value. Alpha is always approximately 0.11, beta is always 0.33, Gamma and delta, which I did not given here, always have the same value. In fact, this is a well-known uh, property of uh, critical um, systems. Uh, here you see, uh, and it's also a very old result. Here you see a result from 1945, um, where uh, basically the same plot is sketched as what I did before. Um, so what I sketched was the, um, I did something like the density as a function of the temperature and I had something like this. But if you flip the axis, then you get precisely this plot uh, where you have the temperature as a function of uh, density for um, the gaseous phase here on the left, the low density and the high density liquid phase on the right. And uh, if you fit the power law to this with some offset that I don't really want to discuss, you'll find the value of beta, which is this uh, 0.33 for all of these eight substances. So I must say the A here is an old notation. Nowadays we say AR, it's argon. And the other uh, molecules I think uh, you know. So this is already interesting. There seem to be these universal numbers. Uh, no, alpha and beta are not equal to one ninth and one third. Alpha and beta are numbers that I'll get to later. Um, this was interesting, but what's maybe even more interesting is um, <clears throat> that you can find similar if is uh, what you observe if you look at critical behavior in other systems. So let's take, for example, a ferromagnet. As we all know, the magnetic field in a ferromagnet, like uh, a magnet you have on the fridge. So we now move from the stove in your kitchen where the boiling water was to the fridge where the ferromagnet is. And um, as we all know, the magnetic field is generated by, uh, or is the constant magnetic field that the ferromagnet sustains. Um, arises because all the electrons or many electrons in the ferromagnet all are spinning along the same axis and therefore oriented in their magnetic fields are oriented in the same direction. This generates the macroscopic magnetic field that for example keeps your fridge magnet uh, to the fridge. Now what happens if you um, raise the temperature, so uh, you put your ferromagnet on the stove, um, is that some of these split spins uh, can start pointing in different directions. So the low energy configuration is the one where all the spins are aligned like so. But if you introduce, allow for thermal fluctuations, the spins can point in other directions like this. Um, and so if you measure the magnetic field of your magnet, the so-called magnetization, you will find this curve here on the right, uh, you will find that it decreases as a function of temperature. And in fact, there exists a critical temperature again, um, which in the context of ferromagnets is called the Curie temperature, above which the magnetic field just vanishes entirely. Um, there is no more uh, magnetization. And the way the magnetization vanishes is precisely again in a power law fashion with the same uh, critical exponent that we call again beta. I'll get to the values of beta and alpha in a second. And uh, similarly for the specific heat of a ferromagnet, you have this power law behavior with a critical exponent alpha. As it happens in certain ferromagnets, so-called uniaxial, so maybe I should write that, uniaxial ferromagnets, which are ferromagnets where the spins uh, cannot point in an arbitrary like direction like this, but are forced by the conditions of the lattice, the microscopic lattice of the system to all lie along exactly one unique axis like so, these are uniaxial ferromagnets. Um, the values of beta, sorry, let me write, the values of beta and alpha are in fact exactly those within experimental error, of course, are exactly those as we saw in the liquid uh, gas phase transition. So these values of beta and alpha here really seem to be universal constant of nature that you can find both in boiling water and in ferromagnets, at least of the uniaxial effect. 
So these are just two examples of systems that exhibit criticality. Critical behavior is much, much more general. Um, I mentioned fluids and uniaxial ferromagnet, but there are also, of course, isotropic ferromagnets like cast iron. Um, there's critical behavior in the superfluid transition uh, of helium-4. There's critical behavior in the superconductive in the transition to superconductivity of various superconductors. And there's really a whole zoo of systems that I definitely won't have time to mention uh, that exhibit this critical behavior. And so you can ask, well, what about the critical exponents for all of these? So if there are power laws everywhere. What are the associated critical exponents? Well, it turns out that the system organized themselves into systems organize themselves into groups. So uh, I already mentioned there are these uh, there are systems for which alpha and beta uh, take these value fluids and uni uniaxial ferromagnets, but isotropic ferromagnets uh, like cast iron uh, have different values of alpha, and here you see a negative value of alpha and beta um, that are clearly distinct from uh, those in the first group. And then there are other groups. So for example, type two superconductors fit into the same group as superfluid helium-4, type one superconductors form yet another group and so on and so on. So, um, and within a group, all the critical exponents agree at least to the extent that we can measure them. So very famously, for example, the beta critical exponent in superfluid helium is not really something you can measure because um, <clears throat> Uh, it would amount to adding individual helium atoms uh, to your system in a controlled manner, which is something that an experimenter would find, of course, impossible to do. But what I want to convey is that these alpha and beta critical exponents for each group are really um, universal constants of nature. They just appear uh, in criticality uh, uh, for various uh, different systems. There's a question about whether you can predict a priori whether a system would, have, would exhibit critical behavior or is just an experimental fact. Um, I think it's a little bit of uh, both. So um, in some cases you can predict critical behavior because um, for example, uh, if I go back to uh, the slide in super, um, because you know, for example, here you see there is a phase transition and it's a so-called first order phase transition. And here you see that the phase transition ends. And if you know that the line of first order phase transitions ends in a phase diagram, you will get um, a second order phase transition, which is another word for uh, criticality, at least in the context in which I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working. So that's an example of, uh, where you can expect, but just by staring at the phase diagram criticality, but sometimes there are other phase transitions uh, where um, it is not entirely clear what happens. So we don't know whether there is a first order transition or a critical uh, point or maybe no phase transition uh, whatsoever. So it's not always entirely obvious, but in some cases you can kind of uh, see it from a, a, a qualitative analysis of the phase diagram. So um, this uh, is basically the end of my introduction. There is this idea of universality of critical behavior. Critical systems fall into a discrete set of uh, universality classes. Um, as a sketch here, boiling water, uni ferromagnets, uh, um, superconductors, superfluid helium, uh, isotropic magnets, and of course, there are many other such universality classes. So um, that terminates, uh, that ends the invitation. Uh, criticality is something we've discussed, power laws I've discussed, and universality. And what I'd like to do in the remainder of the talk is uh, to give you a bit of, um, uh, uh, to give you a bit of an overview of the theoretical understanding that we have uh, for such critical systems. And in particular, a method that is fairly recent that allows you to determine these critical exponents um, using very general um, uh, input. So this new method is really what I want to teach you. And that's uh, the part that I hopefully will get to at the end of the talk. So the remainder of the talk is then divided naturally into three parts. There will be scaling, there will be a thing called a local analysis, and there will be a, a subject part on associativity conditions. So I'll get back to this outline slide. Um, uh, 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 numerous times, so hopefully you can keep track a little bit of where we are in the in the talk. So let's start with um, the scaling bit. 
Um, and for this, I'd like to introduce an example, which is basically um, the, what is known as the easing model or um, the, uh, you can call it a lattice spin model. Um, you can call it whatever it wants. It's description, whatever you want. It's description is actually very simple. You have a lattice. Um, think of a lattice in three dimensions, but for simplicity, I'll draw pictures in two dimensions. So you have a lattice and for every uh, point on the lattice, you associate uh, one of two colors, you make the point either red or blue. And you can think of this as a bit of a model for a uniaxial ferromagnet. It's like there's an electron living on each lattice and um, uh, red, I can say, uh, is the electron pointing in one direction and blue would be the electron spinning in the other direction. Uh, but you can also think of this as a, a toy model for the liquid gas transition, where red means a site is occupied by an atom and blue means a site is empty. And then you think of this as uh, blobs of liquid or gas. And either of these two are uh, very simplistic toy models, but you see that they're very simplistic models of these uh, complicated systems, but they capture the physics very well. So, okay, this is our model. Um, let's also suppose that uh, we are, for example, in a ferromagnetic case, and at low temperatures, all the spins want to be aligned. So what we're gonna say is we're gonna associate an energy to each of the edges in our lattice. You can call these uh, bonds if you want. And the energy will be such that if two spins along an edge are in the same direction, or they have two points of the same color, then we say this is a low energy configuration. And if two spins have a different, different uh, color, then that's a high energy configuration. And the energy difference is some energy scale that I'm not going to quantify. It's not necessary for the Riemann gas system. So then what happens if you put this system at finite temperatures? Well, uh, things start to look a little bit like this. So at very low temperatures, you will have very many low energy um, uh, bonds, low energy connections. So that means that basically all the vertices in my lattice have the same color. So they can either be all red, like so, or all blue, like uh, here on the right. Uh, either way, this is a very low energy configuration. And of course, if there's temperature, there can be some fluctuation. So you can have some small clusters where things are uh, uh, the opposite color appearing in your system. So what you see, if you zoom out, which is what we want to do in an experiment, we don't really see the, the real lattice. We, we zoom out to, to something like a smooth substance. We don't see the individual atoms and molecules anymore. Um, what you see here is that the system can be in one of two states. It can be either red or blue with small clusters of maybe blue and uh, uh, red, with small clusters of the opposite color scattered throughout the system. At very, very high temperature, it looks very different as I sketched here on the right. Uh, it doesn't really matter. There's so much thermal fluctuation, thermal energy, um, that fluctuations allow you to be, to any bond to have any kind of uh, type. It can be high energy, it can be low energy. It doesn't really matter because you have uh, a lot of energy available. So there, if you zoom out, you don't really see something that's clearly blue or clearly red. You just see something in between that's clearly average, uh, like purple. Uh, as an average between blue and red. And maybe there will be small fluctuations of clusters and clusters. What happens at the critical temperature is the most interesting. So if you increase the temperature from the low temperature phase, these clusters will grow in size. And uh, up until the critical temperature, where you will find clusters of small size, like this, this guy here, but you will find clusters of larger size. And if you zoom out and keep zooming out, you will find that they're in fact clusters of all sizes. So you can say that the distribution of, um, of cluster sizes has become more or less uh, uniform. So that means really that um, if you keep zooming out at some point, you don't really see any qualitative change in your system anymore. You just, I'm imagining here, of course, that my system is infinite in extent. And so I've zoomed out so far that I can't see the lattice point anymore. All I see are clusters. I see a certain cluster distribution, I zoom out and I see the same cluster distribution because there are clusters of all possible sizes. And so in that sense, the physics at the critical point is a uh, scale invariant. And the scale invariance of the physics at the critical point is really uh, one of the fundamental properties uh, for and, and essential for our theoretical understanding of, um, 
of uh, critical behavior. So scale invariance is uh, what happens in the way I've explained it here now is in this simple model, but it's in fact uh, the case also for, um, for more complicated systems. So that's what I wanted to convey with uh, this topic of scaling. Uh, there is, um, in fact, a little bit more I can say about this concept of universality, which is not the main topic of the talk, but I'd like to say it anyway because I can and because it's so interesting. So this idea of these different universality class, classes, I can, tie, um, I can tell you now what the systems within a given universality class have in common. And that's what they, what they have in common is the um, possibilities, uh, the possible low temperature phases that they can have. So for example, in our toy model, we saw there were two possibilities of low temperature. We had a red phase and a blue phase. Uh, and so that gives you exactly two possibilities. For uni axial ferromagnet, it's like either spin up or spin down. So that also gives you uh, two phases. And for liquid gas, it also gives you two phases. And so all the systems in this universality class have exactly two possibilities at low temperature. This is different for the systems in this universality class. In this universality class, um, it's a bit harder to explain. I haven't told you the microscopics of uh, neither um, superconductors nor uh, superfluid helium. But uh, as it happens, you can think of this system at low temperatures as having um, an entire circle's worth of possibilities. And this is maybe easier to explain in the context of what is called the biaxial ferromagnets, where the spins in the magnet are constrained by the lattice structure again to lie in a particular two dimensional plane rather than very arbitrarily in two dimensions. And so then you have a bunch of spins which at low temperatures all point into the same direction, but this direction can be arbitrary. And so you get an entire, uh, and I hope then it's more clear that you will have an entire circle sport of possibilities. So we learn also that biaxial ferromagnets fit exactly into this universality class. And for um, isotropic ferromagnets, like um, um, of course the spin can point in any direction. At low temperature, they all point in the same direction, but the direction in which they point can be arbitrary. And so here there is an entire two spheres worth of possibilities. And that is what characterizes the system in this universality class. So at least up to some subtleties that experts know and that I really don't, uh, didn't want to spend too much time on, there's this idea that um, different uh, universality classes of critical behavior, the different red circles on my previous slides, correspond to the different uh, spaces of low temperature um, uh, configurations, the different phase spaces of configurations that you can find at low temperature, either two or a circle's worth or a sphere's worth, or sometimes there are systems where there are three configurations instead of two. Sometimes there are even more complicated uh, patterns. Um, but all of these, in some sense, uh, define a um, universality class. Now, what I have not told you and what I will not tell you is uh, how this idea that these systems all have the same uh, low T phase space of configuration relates to the fact that these systems also have exactly the same critical exponents. Um, but um, maybe it's a little bit obvious from here that um, it's really the fluctuations. Here you see the fluctuations of these two phases. And you can imagine that in another system, it would be the fluctuation of this entire circle's worth of phases or the fluctuation of the sphere's worth of phases is what determines these uh, critical exponents. But that's all very hand wavy. And um, a more precise argument can be made, but I will not have time to, to make it. And it has been made in the 60s and 70s. And uh, this goes under the, uh, falls into the framework of what is known as the renormalization group. And it was pioneered in particular by people like Kadanov and, and Wilson, but also by, uh, by many, many other people. So the renormalization group in some sense helps you understand why these low T configurations uh, um, are so uh, effective in characterizing the system that they can also say that systems with the same low T configuration space have the same critical exponents. So that is the side note. What I really wanted to convey was the scaling, of course, because that's what I'm going to need later. 
So um, <clears throat> this finishes part one. Uh, let's recap again. We have this notion of scale invariance, and I briefly had a detour to this uh, idea of low T phase space and low temperature states, which was connected to this idea of universality. So now we still are not much closer to determining the critical exponents. The next thing we have to do in order to get there is uh, what I call the local analysis. So let's go back to our little model. We have uh, a lattice of sites. We have a high energy, a low energy configurations. We have high energy configurations. And so at every uh, vertex, you can ask whether this is, a, or at every edge, you can ask whether this is a high energy edge or a low energy edge. And of course, in the end, you're going to average all this over uh, uh, thermal fluctuations. And of course, uh, well, the chance that it's a high or low energy edge depends on the temperature in the system. So I wanted to do a local analysis, but let me first contrast this um, by asking with uh, a global question. So a very typical global question that you can ask is um, what is the average energy density maybe in units of the energy difference between the low and the high energy state? What's the average energy density in the system? So we will denote such average uh, like this, uh, typical for a statistical average. The average is over all the configurations weighted with the Boltzmann factors. If you want to be a slightly less precise, you can say it's an average over all the configurations that are typical for the given temperature. So this average definitely depends on the temperature, hence I have the subgroup T. And uh, the one average uh, question we can ask is what's the average energy density? So let me denote the energy density by an epsilon. And so this is a global question. It just, it's not depends on specific, it doesn't depend on specific points. Um, and it's, uh, well, perhaps not surprise you that the answer is um, uh, this increasing function of uh, the temperature uh, at low energy, at low temperature, um, the energy density is low. And then at high temperature, the energy density is of course high. And uh, if you have paid attention, you would also know that the slope precisely at the critical point is exactly vertical, at least in some cases, because the specific heat is the derivative of this curve. It's the difference, uh, the, the derivative of the energy density with respect to the temperature. And uh, since the specific heat diverges, we better have a vertical slope, uh, at least in some cases in our system. Now let's move on from uh, such a global um, question to what I call a local question. We can consider, um, to do so, we consider energy fluctuations. So we take the energy at the point x, and uh, we subtract from it the average energy density. So we look at the fluctuations at the point x. Of course, for any point x, if you average the fluctuations, you get 0. That's the point of fluctuations, or the definition of an average. But you can ask more interesting questions, like um, the core, this, um, what, like, for example, you can compute this particular thermal average. So you see, I take the fluctuations at the point x, I take the fluctuations at the point y, and I take the average of these two quantities in, uh, in the thermal average sense. And this thing uh, you can think of as a thermal, as a, sorry, you can think of as, well, we call it um, a correlation function in, uh, in the thermal average. Um, in this particular, um, for this particular case, we uh, measure the energy density at two points. And so this is called a two-point correlation function. I wanted to say some more things, but in the interest of time, let me, let me skip that. So what is this two-point correlation function um, in, for example, our toy system of um, uh, red and blue points on a lattice? So you see, it depends on three variables. It depends on the temperature, it depends on the position x, and it depends on the position y. Now, um, you can try to compute it at below the critical temperature. You can try to compute it above the critical temperature. But I'm interested in the critical point itself. So let's set the temperature equal to the critical temperature for now. And then I claim that this two-point correlation function of the energy fluctuations is at the critical temperature is given by this very simple expression. 
it is again a power law. Um, it is a power of the Euclidean distance between the points x and y. And this claim is actually fairly easy to prove. Um, so let me now give you the proof of the claim. And the proof just relies on the symmetries of the problem. So I should set, make a few uh, comments here. First of all, I'm looking again into the continuum limits. The effect of the lattice have disappeared. I've zoomed out very far. And then the symmetries of the problems uh, definitely contain the following. So I should have translation invariance. My system is infinite in extent, and it doesn't really matter whether I measure at some point here or I move the points both a little bit to the right um, or to the left or up or down. Um, I should just find the same two-point correlation function. But that means that this correlation function, which initially depended on x and y separately, can only depend on the difference x minus y. So that if I add a vector to both x and y, I translate them, I get the same answer. Furthermore, in the continuum limit, there's also um, often rotational invariance. So it doesn't matter whether I take points x and y here, or I rotate them a little bit. Um, if I rotate them, I should get the same answer. And that means that um, not only does this two-point function depend on the difference between x and y, it should depend. It can depend on the difference only through the Euclidean norm of uh, this vector x minus y. So instead of a function of two vectors, x and y, we have already reduced this to a function of a single um, real variable, uh, which is the Euclidean norm x uh, of x minus y. And then at the critical point, we have this extra bonus symmetry, which is scale invariance. And that tells us that the dependence um, on x minus y should actually be homogeneous. Um, the precise way this comes about and the precise exponent, I can't explain to you now. But scale invariance tells us that this dependence should be homogeneous. And so you have a homogeneous function of a single real variable. Uh, it should be something like this. There's a constant in front. But this constant, actually, I can, I can uh, set it to 1 because it's like a normalization of what they call the energy variation. It's basically a choice of units. So let me set the constant to 1. Um, it'll, it'll disappear. And then all we are left with is this uh, power law. And all that's undetermined in this two-point function of the critical point is this coefficient delta epsilon. Ah. Good question about how is it the yes. rotational invariance is assumed here. You know, we started with the with the quadratic. I, I, I see it. Um, it's again. I have to appeal to this magic. People don't, of... people don't see the question, so let me let me ask it properly. Oh. So, so the the idea that we start with the with the with the cubic lattice, so that does only has a subgroup of the full rotational symmetry, but here you impose the full rotational symmetry, and why is that? It again has to do with this um, magical renormalization group property that I have not quite uh, ex uh, discussed in sufficient um, detail to, to fully explain this. But that means that um, the renormalization group basically says that the microscopics of the system becomes unimportant at long distances. And all that you're left with is this property that is captured by the phases. So. Um, uh, the microscopics um, of the system involve, for example, the choice of lattice. It tells you that um, I can take a cubic lattice uh, or a hexagonal lattice or um, some other lattice. I can, in fact, consider different uh, systems. I can um, <clears throat> different, sorry, different types of systems that all have these two phases in um, um, at low temperatures. And they will all have the same uh, uh, critical exponents. And uh, in fact, also the same correlation functions. So it tells us that certain uh, property, microscopic properties of the system are just washed out completely. And one of the properties that is washed out uh, in certain cases is the, is the property of the lattice. So um, uh, the lattice symmetries, so the, the anisopatries in, anisotropies induced by the lattice get washed out at long distances in the, in the continuum limit. And this is, in fact, um, uh, not uh, something that is always the case. So it is the case in all the phase transitions that I mentioned, but there are other phase transitions where, where these anisotropies uh, can still play a role, even at the very longest distance. But for this particular one, uh, it, it doesn't. 
so it's a good question. It's it's not entirely obvious, but I, I, without explaining much more, I can't I can't tell you that why this particular microscopic property has no effect on the long distance uh, physics. So uh, what about this delta epsilon? Well, do we have a new critical exponent? Is this delta epsilon yet another power? Turns out it's not. It's uh, directly related to the alpha critical exponent that we have before. So, and in fact, the relation is very simple. It's this algebraic relation. Uh, so for example, if alpha is 0.11, as we saw before in many systems, then delta epsilon comes out to be about 1.4. So that means that knowing these deltas means knowing uh, the critical exponents. And this is in fact, not just true for alpha, it's also true uh, for beta and all the other critical exponents. So let me briefly show how beta gets, uh, comes out of this. Beta is given by this combination of deltas, where delta epsilon is the one that we saw before. It's uh, the variation of, uh, it's the two point function of the energy fluctuation. And delta sigma is um, what you can call the two point function of spin or color fluctuations. So let's associate to the red point sigma equals plus one, to the blue point sigma equals minus one. And then you can have, uh, compute the two point functions of fluctuations in, in sigma. Um, and this particular two point function by the same argument as before also has this power law form with a different uh, exponent, uh, which is delta sigma. And this delta sigma is related to the critical exponent beta uh, with delta epsilon and epsilon. So similarly, all the critical exponents are determined in terms of these deltas that appear in the two point correlation function. And this is a little bit uh, non-obvious. Again, it's something that uh, some of the, not, I cannot give you a full explanation for, but um, one way to think about the connection a little bit is um, <clears throat> to say that um, alpha, which is uh, the divergence in the specific heat has to do with uh, changing the energy or has to do with changing the energy as a whole, the specific heat is measured by uh, changing uh, uh, the change in the energy as a function of the temperature. And so what we do here is we measure the change in the energy only locally. But um, um, in some sense, if you uh, a change in the energy globally is just a sum of uh, infinitesimal changes in the energy locally. And so that's how um, the change in the energy uh, is captured both by this delta epsilon. And, uh, and by the, by the alpha. And there's a secondary aspect to this, which is that changing the temperature is, um, so that would be sort of the first term in this thing. Uh, changing the temperature is also related to uh, changing epsilon as a whole. Uh, but this really takes me too far afield into the microscopics of this system. So I don't really want to, uh, to go into those details, but let's say that, um, I can give you a further explanation in the Q&A if there's time at the end of this talk. So um, the upshot here is just that knowing these uh, capital deltas here tells you about the critical exponents. And so we have a local way of approaching this problem of determining the critical exponents. So these were two point correlation functions. You can ask, um, of course, what about other correlation functions? Can I look at endpoint correlation functions? Where I insert these, uh, measure these fluctuations at n different points simultaneously, again in the thermal ensemble at the critical temperature. And this is certainly possible. So you can take an endpoint function of epsilons and sigmas. I'm omitting the deltas now just for uh, simplicity, but you can imagine them, um, of course. Um, and in fact, you don't have to restrict yourself to just epsilon and sigma. You can also, there are other operators like sigma prime, um, tij, some operators are uh, tensors. Um, and in fact, there's an infinite zoo of operators that you can all insert at the point. Microscopically, you can, for example, think of them as the energy in one bond minus the energy of the adjacent bond uh, or plus the energy of the adjacent bond, things like that which in the continuum limit, uh, if you zoom out far enough, become uh, excitations or measurements at a single point. And uh, these are what we call um, local operators in the field. 
And so you can ask, what about the endpoint correlation functions of such, say, randomly chosen local operator? Well, can we determine them? Can we maybe do as well as we did for the two-point function, where we determined this, in principle, complicated function uh, to be a very simple homogeneous uh, power? So let's look at the symmetries of the problem. Um, I already told you there are translations, like this, all the points move to the right. There are rotations, like this, where all the points, well, points do what, what they do on the rotations. And there are scale transformations, which is basically blowing up your system so all the points move apart a little bit or move closer towards each other. But besides these three transformations, there's also a fourth um, symmetry uh, class in this system, which is so-called uh, conformal invariance. And this conformal invariance is a little bit more mysterious. It's a bit harder to, um, to draw uh, something that would um, immediately convey the idea of a conformal transformation. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time explaining what these conformal invariance is, which is of course important because we would like to know the symmetry because we would like to know about these correlation functions. Are. So here is a drawing by Escher, which um, maybe illustrates a little bit uh, the idea of a conformal transformation. Of course, the drawing is Escherish, escher isk in itself. Uh, it's a little bit odd. What is the painting here it becomes the background uh, here. But uh, the particular distortion applied to um, the objects in the painting is that of a conformal transformation. So I said it's like a combined local scale transformation and rotation. And you can see that a little bit in the sense that, um, uh, for example, here, this object is small. It becomes large here. So it's definitely scaled inhomogeneously. And also what is straight here becomes, uh, becomes curved here. So uh, that is um, uh, uh, the effect of this, of this local rotation. In fact, conformal transformations have this funny property that they do preserve angles. So for example, this 90 degree angle up to uh, the distortions given by the perspective of the painting um, persists. This angle is uh, the same 90 degrees. So if you measure angles and then you apply a conformal transformation, you measure the angles again, uh, they are still the same. So this is just to give you a crude idea of these conformal transformations. Maybe a more intuitive way to see where this conformal invariance comes from, this invariance on the conformal transformations, is to say that it comes from a local scale invariance. So what you're allowed to do, uh, turns out, for a system at criticality is not just apply a global scale transformation where you scale all the points with a constant factor and then, as I said, you find the same system back. What you're allowed to do is also do a local transformation where you blow up all the points in, in one part of your system, um, but not in another part of the system. And maybe if you think in terms of these clusters of all possible sizes, you see that um, you may expect that this um, does not uh, really affect, uh, this is a symmetry in the same sense, as a global scale transformation would be a constant scale transformation. So this is the idea of uh, local um, scale invariance. Maybe uh, for the more mathematically oriented people, I can say that um, there are the following constraints for correlation functions. So in fact, you can define these correlation functions. I've so far talked about uh, the continuum limit, which is just flat Euclidean space of a, the continuum limit of a square lattice which gave me flat Euclidean space. But in fact, you can consider, you can imagine defining um, these systems to live on any uh, background. And in background here would be a smooth manifold M with some Riemannian metric uh, G on it. And then my claim is that the correlation functions are covariant, transform covariantly under both diffeomorphisms on M and uh, as well as under Valby scalings which are rescalings of the Riemannian metric G with some um, positive function um, lambda, strictly positive function lambda defined on M. And of course, if the correlation functions uh, transform covariantly, then if you consider isometries or even conformal isometries, which leave the metric invariant up to the scale transformation, then 
you're going to get constraints on this correlation function. So examples of isometries would be the translations and the rotations. Any some examples of the conformal isometries would be um, scale transformation and these so-called conformal transformations. So these give constraints on the correlation function. And I've already shown you how these constraints can help you determine the functional form of these correlation functions. What you call, what we call a conformal field theory or CFT is really um, for mathematical purposes to a first very crude approximation you can think of as a consistent set of correlation functions um, as an object that gives you a consistent set of and maximal set of correlation functions on any such background. So let's go back to our problem of determining endpoint correlation functions. Uh, we have enumerated the symmetries. How do these symmetries help us? And in fact, they help us in complicated ways. They severely constrain the functional form of this correlation function, but not to such an extent that it's very easy to write down the answer. So the answer can still be a fairly complicated function. Just as one example, this one is actually rather nice. The three-point function of an operator like the epsilon operator is really nice. It's just these three different uh, Euclidean norms raised to the power minus delta epsilon. And then the whole thing gets multiplied by a uh, number, which is uh, the so-called, which is which I call the three-point coupling between three epsilon uh, operators. And this thing is not normalization invariant. Um, it's not, um, uh, it's, a, it's actually a physical observable, I should say. In the two-point function, I had a number that I called C. And I said, well, let's just define the energy scale such that this number is one. Once I fix that energy scale, I am no longer free to rescale this operator epsilon. And this three-point coupling is actually a real physical number in the pool. So besides the deltas, the lambdas are also um, physical uh, real numbers that you can associate to a critical system. So this uh, finishes the local analysis. So we have um, these, uh, let's recall, we have this two-point function of say the epsilon operator. It has this nice power, nice uh, simple power law form. Uh, this capital deltas, I haven't given them a name yet, but they're called scaling dimensions. So these are the scaling dimensions. And from the scaling dimensions of these operators, we can uh, immediately determine the critical exponent. And then for the higher point functions, I didn't tell you much, but I did tell you that they have conformal symmetry. So these were the necessary ingredients for um, the last part of the talk, which is about associativity conditions. So this idea of local scale invariance is really powerful. It tells us that correlation functions in flat Euclidean d-dimensional space are related to correlation functions on any background that is well, well related to that background maybe up to one or two point compactifications um, to uh, the original Euclidean space. So for example, the sphere, uh, the round metric on the sphere has is conformally flat. So correlation functions on RD immediately determine the correlation functions on SD. And they also determine the correlation functions on the cylinder SD minus one cos R. So it's really powerful property of these uh, conformally invariant correlation functions. What they also do is something that we will use later, um, is you can apply a conformal transformation like so, you consider for example, four points, that brings these two of these points very close to each other and moves the other points uh, right far away. You cannot do this with global scale transformations, but with local scale, trans with local scale transformations or conformal transformations, you can do this. And if two operators in a correlation functions are very close, then from far away, um, uh, so there is a question. question. There's a I, question I, about the statement that two. But you need to repeat it because people don't see the question. Okay. There's a okay. question about uh, the fact that uh, people are um, perhaps more familiar with conformal invariance in two dimensions, but what do why do we bring it up in three dimensions right and again i think i have to be i have to say to have to refer to the um, renormalization group but this is actually much more delicate but there's an idea that um, if you have a scale invariant system then you have conformality that's something i implicitly assumed 
uh, it's not entirely obvious and it's something that uh, um, people have worked on quite a bit in, in recent years, including uh, members of our uh, collaboration. So, um, but what happens is that um, at least a naive uh, way of thinking about this, again, by again referring to this renormalization group idea, where uh, there are certain operators that, um, Mm. Am I saying this correctly? No, sorry, I, I take that back. It's not entirely a consequence of, of the renormalization group, but it is a consequence of the operator content in the theory. So if you know to reasonable accuracy the scaling dimensions of the various operators in the theory, then uh, you can tell that uh, a system is, is conformally invariant. But there are examples in, in two and also in higher dimensions of theories that happen to be scale invariant, but not conformal. And they turn out to be um, uh, in, in a slightly different class of systems than the one I'm considering here. Um, but such systems do exist. And in that case, the methods that I'm about to explain uh, no longer work because these, uh, these theories are not, uh, don't have to conform with symmetry. But again, for many phase transitions, and in particular for all the ones that I highlighted, the system does turn out to be conformal. Okay, so um, where was I? I said by conformal transformations, you can move two operators very close to each other. And if two operators are very close, then uh, you can view them basically as a sum of uh, local operators because from far away, it just looks like a, a single local operator again. And you've already chosen a sort of basis of local operators. So a single local operator will generally be a linear combination of the local operators in the basis that you've chosen. So you find something like this, you have two operators by one and by two, and uh, when they're close enough together, you can write them as a sum of operators phi k inserted at the midpoint between x and y. Um, and the sum is actually fairly complicated. There's a prefactor that depends on the difference of the distance. Uh, it also depends on all the scaling dimensions of all the operators involved, uh, a bunch of other things. And then there is a, a so-called operator, uh, so-called OPE coefficient lambda one to k that multiplies uh, each term in the sum. Um, so OPE, I already mentioned it, uh, refers to operator product expansion. You see you have a product of operators and you expand that in a sum of uh, local operators. There's a question here, perhaps uh, answer quickly. Um, so what does close mean given that the system is really scale invariant? Uh, what close means is that it's um, close enough so that no other operators interfere. So I can uh, draw, for example, uh, here, I can take operator one and operator two. And of course you have this freedom to do conformal transformation. So they can be closed in uh, various ways, but definitely if there's an operator three sitting in the middle, then uh, that does not work. So we have to take this operator three and move it far away. And in fact, if you can draw a sphere around one and two, like so, that doesn't enclose any other operators, then they're close enough. But after, maybe after conformal transformation, but it's, uh, they're close enough for this um, operator product expansion to work and for this sum to converge. So you see that this operator product expansion has actually a finite radius of convergence. Um, <coughs> So uh, this uh, so this idea of the operator product expansion allows you to take, for example, a one, two, three, four, five point function and write it as a sum of four point functions. And this really works and it converges for this uh, conformal field theories, which is called critical systems. So this is a nice gadget. Now let's take a four point function like this and apply the operator product expansion. Um, so we have uh, this sum over operators k, which uh, replace operators um, uh, one and two. And um, then we have a sum over three point functions. Let's apply the operator product expansion again, but now for operators three and four. So fuse these two together and you have a sum, a double sum in fact, 
the two of E coefficients, lambda 1 to k, lambda 3 for k, complicated prefactors, and two point functions. Well, two point functions, of course, we know two point functions are these uh, simple power laws. So, this whole gadget, in fact, we know it's a complicated function of the positions, but we know what its functional form is. It's a complicated function, not just of the positions, but also of all the deltas involved. Um, so that's nice. If you want to compute a four-point function, all you need to know are basically the lambdas and the deltas that sit here. And if you know all of those, you can build up a four-point function from two-point functions and uh, from deltas and lambdas. So this is really true. You can do this. But of course, you can build up the four-point function in a different way also. You can also decide to fuse first two and three together, and then one and four together. So that gives you um, a uh, decomposition of the four-point function, which looks very different. You have different coefficients, you may have different lambdas, and so on, but it's the same four-point function, so it's equally valid. So this is nice. Okay, we can compute four-point functions in a, in, a, um, in a way, provided we know what the lambdas and the deltas are. But actually, the lambdas and the deltas are precisely the things we're after, the deltas in particular, because they're the critical exponents. So but what you can do is forget that you're trying to compute a four-point function and just look at this equation. I've um, written the same equation where I stylized a little bit these uh, sum over two-point functions with prefactors into something like this. And here are two-point functions with prefactors look like this. And I've stylized uh, it a bit, but it's the same equation. So you have lambdas and you have the deltas hidden in these, uh, in these gadgets. And if you look at this equation, you see an equation that has to be true for um, a whole bunch of values, um, almost every value of x1, x2, x3, and x4. So it looks like a very strong set of constraints on the lambdas and the deltas. For every different positions for which these sum converge, we get the different constraints on the lambdas and the deltas. They have to combine in such a way that the sum on the left-hand side and the sum on the right-hand side is the same. And mathematicians will, of course, immediately um, and recognize this as an associativity constraint on, uh, on what the operator product expansion is basically an operator algebra, or is an operator algebra, a position dependent associative operator algebra. So um, what you get from this local analysis in particular of four point functions is this, um, is this set of constraints for the lambdas and deltas that goes under the name of crossing symmetry. And notice that it's independent of any microscopic formulation. It's just a general point property of correlation functions in critical systems. So it's a very natural question to ask if these constraints can be used to actually determine critical exponents. And to some extent, the answer turns out to be yes. And uh, in two dimensions, uh, there was already a question about two dimensions. Um, a lot of progress in this direction was made by uh, these people already back in 1984. The two dimensions are very special. The sums are very simple in some cases. They're just finite sums and uh, things are uh, relatively easy. So for a long time, it seemed really hard to make progress in higher dimensions. The main problem being that these sums that I've written here are um, almost always infinite sums. And so you have infinitely many lambdas and deltas that you want to determine. Uh, you, of course, by inserting at different positions, also have infinitely many constraints. So it's a bit, it was hard, difficult to attack it. But then in 2008, there was a real uh, breakthrough paper by these uh, four gentlemen um, who were able to um, disentangle these uh, conditions and devise some way to um, actually compute constraints uh, to, uh, to actually get some quantitative information about the scaling dimensions from these systems. And uh, what they uh, did, for example, is that they had to start from something. So they made some assumption. And they said, for example, suppose there's at least one scaling, there's one particular operator whose scaling dimension is 1.4. Then they could show that by virtue of these um, crossing equations, there had to be another operator in the theory, at least somewhere, uh, with a scaling dimension that is, uh, say, about some random number, about 3.8. So this is something they, they could show that's not quite determining the critical exponents, but it's getting pretty close. So this led to a lot of follow-up work and um, uh, many different papers that I don't have time to uh, cite. 
Um, but uh, eventually, um, <clears throat> uh, one let me highlight just this one by uh, Klaus Poland and Simon Stuffin, who uh, did a slightly more sophisticated analysis of three different uh, um, four-point functions at the same time. And they pro provided um, actual intervals in which the scaling dimensions and therefore the critical exponents must map. And they said, if um, the theory has a symmetry, uh, which is uh, Z2 symmetry, which you can think of as the symmetry that interchanges blue with red and vice versa. Um, and, okay, some other conditions that I cannot, uh, that I don't want to quite mention here. Um, the fact that there are only two uh, particular operators that are important at long distances. There is one operator which uh, has, which we've already encountered, which is the sigma operator. There's another operator, which is the epsilon operator. And then all the other operators have a fairly high scaling dimension, which physically is a completely reasonable assumption to make, I must say. Then under these conditions, you can determine um, that delta sigma must lie in some finite interval and delta epsilon must also lie in some finite interval. And this of course uh, translates directly into a finite interval for the critical exponents. And uh, in, I'm not sure, and these, are currently the most precise values known of these uh, critical exponents uh, that we can obtain in this method. And these are in fact, the uh, most precise way to determine these um, critical exponents out of all possible methods. Um, I think these values don't quite come from this paper. They come from a, a follow-up paper, but these are the, the best known uh, critical exponents that follow from the analysis of these associativity conditions. And of course, there are many, many other works that I definitely don't have time to cite here. So you see that, um, uh, sorry, let me check for a second. So you see that um, one of the nice properties of, um, <clears throat> of this analysis is that there is really no um, reference to any microscopic description. I didn't say gas, um, uh, vapor gas, trans liquid gas transition. I didn't say ferromagnet. Uh, there are very general properties like the low temperature phase, the blue versus red, the two possibilities that we referred to before, and then some very physical assumption. And what, out, what comes out are these uh, critical exponents. So this also goes a long way towards explaining the universality of these um, uh, of these critical exponents, because to some extent, this seem to be the only consistent critical exponents possible. They're the only ones that are consistent with uh, the constraints, the associativity constraints that you get from conformal invariants. So I had prepared some uh, other slides, in particular, some technical slides on the way um, you can numerically uh, use numerical methods to deduce these uh, these kind of constraints that I've given you here in black. Um, but in the interest of time, let me skip that and jump straight to the conclusions. And then people can ask me in the Q&A session about it afterwards. So just to summarize, critical exponents are the main observables. Uh, they tell us how systems, very systems approach criticality. They're a universal constant of nature in some sense because they're the same number for many different systems. In a local analysis, these very nicely show up as the scaling dimensions delta that appear in correlation functions. And by virtue of conformal invariance and the operator product expansion, there are certain associativity conditions that can help us um, determine these critical exponents in a way that we would like to call a bootstrappy way. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, um, in other, which in particular means that there's no, not, a, not a macroscopic input and we just use the symmetries of the theory alone to uh, arrive at uh, an answer. And in particular, the conformal symmetry uh, you have seen plays an essential role in deriving uh, these uh, values of the critical exponents. So this is just the tip of, uh, well, this is just one or a few of the results that I've had time to discuss, but uh, all of this sparked a huge amount of renewed interest into conformal field theories in general. And um, we know not only can our, 
compute critical exponents, but we also understand the spectrum of these operators. Uh, the spectrum of operators in conformal field theory is much better. Uh, we have keep continuing to improve our numerical approaches, but also analytical techniques to uh, improve our understanding of conformal field theories and conformal correlation functions. And so these conformal correlation functions are really the main topic of interest of uh, our collaboration, the Simons collaboration on the non-perturbative bootstrap. And if you want to know a little bit more about we, what we do, there are other topics that I definitely did not have time to discuss that uh, you can find on our website, uh, bootstrapcollaboration.com. So let me stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Balt. So there were a couple of um, uh, quick questions you perhaps answer whether we can explain the resistivity of copper by uh, by this kind of critical exponent methods or, or Husserl methods. I don't know um, the answer myself, but I don't think it can. It is not the kind of question that we can answer. We can answer the critical behavior, so the, the critical exponent. Um, but if you're very far from criticality, then there is no, um, uh, then all of our techniques, this is a very specific technique that relies on this conformal invariant. And then all of these um, techniques go out the window. And uh, that is not the kind of physics we can attack with uh, these techniques. And another quick question that was asked was whether the OP relies on conformal invariants. Um, I think I only know of a good proof of convergence of these crossing symmetry equations. So the OPE, sorry, let me go back to a slide that I actually showed you, uh, not slides that I skipped in the interest of time. These are the crossing symmetry equations. Um, so the fact that you have convergence sums of both on the left and the right is essential for a numerical analysis. And I don't know of any proof that the operator product expansion gives you these convergent sums in theories that don't have conformal invariants. Whereas in conformal invariant theories, in particular because of this local value scaling, I can give you a proof at the physical level of rigor that these sums are actually convergent. And of course, post facto, the fact that we can determine these critical exponents uh, all, uh, from these uh, equations assuming convergence also shows that they are um, likely to converge, uh, that there also indicates that they're really converging. Of course, the operator product expansion is used more generally in quantum field theory, but uh, in most cases, it's just an asymptotic expansion that has no uh, real finite radius of convergence. So there's a, another question I'd like to highlight is a question about uh, whether criticality depends on it being thermal fluctuations or we can envision also quantum criticality. Um, for our purposes, um, I don't think there is a big difference. Uh, criticality is criticality. The moment you've seen what my ingredients were, it was scale invariance, uh, it was conformal invariance, um, as I, and and translations and rotations. So these don't always appear in quantum critical point or, or critical points because, uh, or thermal criticality, because sometimes there is no conformal symmetry. Um, you just have scale symmetry. Sometimes you don't really have uh, homogeneous scale symmetry. Sometimes like certain dimensions change inhomogeneously. Um, and then uh, you also don't have, uh, so yeah, in, in such cases, um, you don't have uh, enough symmetries to be able to write down these convergence crossing symmetry equations uh, to be able to apply our methods. But there are certainly uh, quantum critical points with conformal symmetry where uh, we, can, um, we can apply our methods. So we're approaching the end of our time. There are uh, a couple of more expert questions. Perhaps we can end with those unless somebody has some other urgent question. And the question, one is again, harping on the issue of conformal versus scale invariants whether it's really true that if you have divergent correlation length that implies conformal invariance or whether this is just a powerful hypothesis in many examples. Uh, That's a, let's, can I stop here? I, I think it's a fantastic question, yeah. Um, 
No, it is definitely not proven that all continuous uh, phase transitions with divergent correlation functions have uh, correlation length have conformal invariance. And um, I think it is proven in two dimensions under certain plausible assumptions, such as such as reflection positivity. <laughs> and yes, it, I was I was getting there, Leo. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. So if you have reflection positivity, you can say a lot more. Uh, in reflection positive systems, uh, in two dimensions, it's proven, and it's, I guess, very likely in four dimensions. I'm not sure what you would say, uh, Leonardo. Um, it looks like a lot of strange things will happen if you have scale but not conformal invariance in reflection positive systems in, in higher dimensions. To say that it's proven, uh, I, I'm not sure I want to go that, that far. But it's definitely, I mean, there were papers on this. Uh, uh, a few years ago. So this is an active topic of, of research. And then one final question, whether this approach has led to the discovery of new universality classes of critical behavior. Not yet. Um, but uh, um, what we do is we analyze these uh, correlation functions. And um, it's in fact not entirely obvious. It's, it's not so easy to um, determine uh, to get uh, sufficient assumptions so that you have to make sufficient assumptions so that you really get a bound, like finite intervals in which your critical exponents can lie. It's more often the case that you find these kind of general results. If something exists, then something else exists. And so what we have to do is analyze uh, more correlation. Uh, and sometimes we do see some hints of non-trivial structure here. So you can vary delta one, and then delta two varies also, of course, and you find some strange odd features in the plots that you get like kinks. Um, and we don't always understand all of these kinks. And some of these um, seem to indicate that maybe there's some physics going on uh, um, that we don't quite understand that doesn't fit in, uh, in one of our uh, known models of, uh, or known uh, critical systems. So yeah, this is, this is work in progress. But um, we're searching around a little bit by making various assumptions, assuming various symmetries in particular, uh, analyzing different correlation functions. And who knows what we'll find.